Wisconsin Eye's 2014 election coverage is brought to you by the Wisconsin Hospital Association. For over 90 years, a valued voice for Wisconsin hospitals, supporting high quality, high value care in communities like yours. Wisconsin Eye continues its coverage of the 2014 elections with a interview with Mr. Jeremy Ryan. He's a Republican running in the 1st Congressional District. Mr. Ryan, welcome to Wisconsin Eye. Thank you. Just a programming note, Wisconsin Eye appreciates the support of the Wisconsin Hospital Association, which represents more than 139 hospitals and health systems for making these candidate interviews possible. Um, Jeremy, I normally ask people to give us the short bio. I see on your website you're from Belleville? Correct. I, I uh, graduated from Belleville, yeah. Belleville. Mm -hmm. And you've been in Madison for how long? Uh, probably since 2008, so about six years. Did you come here to go to the UW or MATC? or? Uh, no, I just came here because I lived in Belleville. I was looking for a larger city. Okay. To live in. Yeah. Okay. Well, you, uh, would you admit you're kind of best known as one of the first protesters? I mean, your Facebook page says you're first protester illegally ticketed in the Wisconsin Capitol for using that traditional and designated public forum to petition his government for redress of grievance. So yeah, um, I mean, you can't really say that there's any original protesters, but uh, you, you know, I am certainly pretty well known for my protest efforts, and I was there since the beginning um, with many other people, um, and I did start the civil disobedience arrests in the Capitol for constitutional rights. Okay, what um, what so intrigued you, or what made you so concerned that you were up there as a as a protester? Uh, it was mostly the transparency. Um, when Act 10 was brought out, and, and this is where a lot of people get me confused. Okay. A lot of people think that I was uh, protesting Act 10 because of the union provisions. And while I do believe that unions are a necessary check to the corporation's balance, um, I would not fight a union fight. The unions have their own money to do that. I would not place my life in the line of fighting a sole union fight. Okay. What I didn't like about the bill is that there was so much stuff tied into it and nobody knew what was there. It was a major transparency issue. So regardless of the content, I didn't agree with the content, but I wouldn't have put my life on hold to protest the content. I was protesting the process and the transparency behind the bill. Um, and I still think that's a problem to this day. Were you surprised how the protest got so big with more than 100,000 there on any one day? I, I was surprised. Uh, on February 14th, the first day, uh, on Valentine's Day when I had went, there were probably about 100, 200 people if I remember correctly. Um, and they had said, well, we're coming back tomorrow. And I was thinking, well, we'll be lucky if we get 400 or 500. And it came back the next day and there were 10,000, 20,000 maybe. Um, and then it just kept building and building and building. Uh, and it, it did surprise me, and I believe, I, I mean, it's definitely the largest social movement um, in, in my generation in one given city. Uh, and so I, I do think it was uh, major and it was astounding. And it did show that people can send a message and people can have power. What do you think is his message three and a half years later as you look back over the protests of 2011? Whose message? Uh, the, the, the message of protesters like, like, like yourself, is it still healthy? I mean, the uh, singers are still singing? I think it is still healthy. I mean, we don't have the same numbers we used to have. Uh, and so it's not as large as it used to be. Uh, but we are still there. There's still a presence. And at least on a small level, I think that does make a difference. Uh, and I don't think that they would want to arrest us for singing if we weren't, uh, if we weren't uh, doing anything. <laughs> Well, now let's talk about the reason that uh, you're being interviewed and that you've chosen to run um, not for any state office, but for the 1st District U.S. House. So talk to me about your transition and what, what went into your decision to run for Paul Ryan's seat in Congress. You're Jeremy, Ry Jeremy Ryan and Paul Ryan is the incumbent. Yeah, um, there were a couple of reasons. Uh, one, I wanted to challenge the major system as it is now. And I felt that a good way to do that would be to challenge a leader of the system. Um, another reason is I wanted to help try to rebrand the Republican Party much the same way that the Tea Party did, um, but in a different direction. Um, not necessarily a democratic direction, but a more progressive direction. There's a lot of progressive ideals that I feel that most Republicans and most Democrats can agree on. Mm -hmm. So I say, why don't we focus on those? and get those passed and create real change that we can all agree with and then we can start bickering about the stuff that we don't agree with. Okay. Um, and then the third reason is because 
I realized that if I were to run for a race, uh, I would get almost no publicity. The candidates would brush me aside. But having the same last name as Paul Ryan makes it so he has to acknowledge me and has to draw attention to me and what I stand for in order to differentiate himself from me. So it throws a new dynamic that allows me to promote my ideas and help bring about change within the Republican Party. Do you think some voters on August 12th, which is a primary date, will be confused, Jeremy versus Paul? I, I think they may, but that's only if they don't really look into anything. And I don't think, uh, I don't think it's very healthy to have voters uh, that, don't, that don't read a single thing about any of the candidates. And so if they do get confused, I think it is completely all on them. Okay. Um, why don't you outline your top two or three issues, the, why, why, why you're running and how you differ from, uh, from Paul Ryan? Uh, one issue is getting money out of politics. Uh, I support the move to amend constitutional amendment mm -hmm. to take money out of politics and overturn Citizens United. Uh, I think that's a major problem. 80% of the country stands with me on that. And so it's clearly not a democratic issue. And I think Paul Ryan exemplifies money in politics yeah, in the system. He's got $4 million in his campaign treasury. Mm -hmm. How much do you think you have <laughs> right now? Um, probably about three to five hundred. Three to five hundred. Yeah. Okay. Well, excuse me. Go, go, go ahead. Yeah, but um, he's uh, but I mean, he exemplifies that system with his fancy dinners with lobbyists, with four hundred dollar bottles of wine, um, with his corporate donations. You know, all of his donations. Most of them are not from individuals within his district to begin with, and many of them are not from individuals. Period. Um, they might not be direct corporate donations, but corporate PACs, lobbying organizations, uh, special interests. I want to get rid of all of that. Yeah, in fact, on your cam campaign website, you say if elected, you would begin a series of dinner with constituents. Correct. Uh, I would like to offer a new initiative. Since I won't be meeting with lobbyists, um, I'll only be meeting with constituents, uh, I would like to take that time that Paul Ryan takes at fancy dinners with lobbyists and actually have dinners and potlucks with the constituents, people who contact my office throughout the year. Um, I, I hope to do it once a week, uh, but if the congressional schedule doesn't permit, then I may not be able to do that. But I do want to do it very frequently and choose people who have emailed or written or called my office, um, either supporting or, or uh, opposing me, mm -hmm. and get both sides together and let's talk over dinner, have so a you, nice dinner. So you're the, the number one issue is the campaign finance reform and overturning through a constitutional amendment the Citizens United ruling. It's kind of hard to say any one issue okay. is number one, but that is one of my main priorities. One of the major yeah. ones. Yeah. What's, wh what's another one of your major ones? Also creating a livable minimum wage. Okay. Um, I believe that uh, if we were to uh, have a livable minimum wage, it would, uh, it would lessen our reliance on social programs um, like SSI, uh, like Medicaid. Uh, food stamps, Section 8 housing, all social welfare programs I think could be dr drastically reduced uh, if we had a uh, livable minimum wage. Now there would be certain exemptions for legitimate small businesses, um, but as people start making more money you'll see less legitimate small businesses that can't meet that threshold because people are making more money. And products may go up a little bit, but if products go up a little bit and wages go up uh, significantly, um, uh, at least on the low end. Um, keep in mind the average worker is not making minimum wage, but there are a lot of workers making minimum wage and a lot of those people are on social programs, uh, welfare programs. Well, you've heard debate in the capital of going to a 10-10 minimum wage. I think Seattle just went to a 15. What, what, what number would you favor? I'm not entirely sure yet. I have to crunch the numbers and see what uh, what what is the average cost for a standard apartment you know like a standard one bedroom apartment and food across the country and that I could easily do in office you can crunch numbers like that pretty easily right. and see and, and see exactly what the wage should be um, but I also think that the wage needs to have increases with inflation that's a more important part than necessarily what we wage it uh, what we raise it to otherwise 20 30 years from now we could be looking at the same problem again um, um, and I don't want to do that. I want to fix a problem and keep it fixed. Okay. Uh, and so if we have minimum wage increases with inflation, which would be easy to do, um, then, uh, then it keeps going up a little by little uh, every couple years or so, um, and it keeps staying consistent with what's needed to live. 
So campaign finance and raise the minimum wage, uh, yeah. your third major issue? Uh, third major issue, uh, which is kind of with raising minimum wage and on jobs, is regulating corporations for outsourcing. I think that if a corporation, I think that, you know, people talk about if we start, uh, if we start regulating corporations and also making them pay uh, some sort of taxes, um, then they're going to move their jobs overseas. But we can also regulate that. We can say if you start in the U.S. and you make a certain percentage of your profits in the U.S., that you keep a certain percentage of your jobs in the U.S. Countries just use our market to start up and then they go elsewhere. Um, and it's because we've set up our system so we're so easy to use and abuse. Um, why wouldn't you? I mean, human nature is to do whatever you can. Um, and so if you can do it, why not? But I think that we have an obligation. I think we have a certain value to our labor pool here and a certain value to our economy here that we need to start putting a value on. And, uh, and I don't see anyone in Washington trying to do that. Okay. Um, and then on top of that, I want to bring money into the country by legalizing marijuana. Um, first off, we can tax it. Uh, California alone makes an estimated $1.1 billion off medical marijuana alone in taxes. $1 billion a year? Yeah. Just off medical marijuana? Just off medical. Uh, okay. Imagine if that could be replicated across the country. That's a lot of revenue. Um, in addition, uh, on the medical end, I think it's a humanitarian thing. There are so many conditions and there's so much medical evidence that it helps um, just as much, if not more, than pharmaceutical options. It's also clinically proven that it is safer for you than pretty much any pharmaceutical drug out there. And so, uh, so on a humanitarian aspect, we shouldn't be forcing people to poison themselves um, over, over prohibition of a plant. On the recreational end, I think we need to bring back personal responsibility. I think people should be able to take responsibility for their own actions. Recreational marijuana would have safeguards so that children, much like cigarettes or alcohol, so mm -hmm. you wouldn't have minors being able to go to the store and buy marijuana. Um, and medical would have safeguards for parents um, so that you know children couldn't get on it unless their parents said it was okay, much like morphine or anything like that. Um, and so. Uh, but I do think that that could exponentially boost our economy. Um, and it could also help in Wisconsin with the farming. There's a lot of farmers that would probably like to grow marijuana if they could. Um, and they could make a lot of money. And we could help boost the farming economy right here in the first district and in the state of Wisconsin. How do you general. feel about law officers who say, well, if you legalize marijuana, you're going to encourage uh, the use of more dangerous drugs, Jeremy? I don't buy that. Um, I don't buy that argument at all. I think, the, I think there's a couple reasons why people go from marijuana to other drugs. Um, I think one reason is because they feel lied to. Um, they're pushed a very inaccurate uh, representation of what marijuana is, and they're pushed uh, to believe in schools that, uh, that it's a, a bad drug, um, that it's going to have negative effects towards you. And then when they try it out, they realize they've been lied to. Um, not, and so then they, then they wonder, well, what about this other drug that they said? Maybe I was lied to about that. Maybe yeah. I was lied to about that. The other thing is I think certain people are born with a uh, psychology to experiment and they want to try different things and that's a psychological thing. Um, and so I think that they just start with marijuana maybe and then they have that urge within themselves to try something else and they do and some of these people may even only try it once but have very low addiction th thresholds and so they may end up getting addicted off of trying something like say heroin once mm -hmm. um, that's been known to happen. Well medical mar marijuana gets us into the issue of health care. How do you feel about the uh, Affordable Care Act? Has it been a success? Depends upon what you're talking about. Um, well, President Obama, uh, let's preface it this way. Or what aspect I meant. Well, President yeah. Obama says it's working because seven or eight million more people have health care, so he considers it a, a, a victory. H mm -hmm. How about you? Again, I mean, yes and no. Uh, I think that the Affordable Care Act was mainly uh, a, a giveaway to the insurance companies. Um, and I, I do think, I, I don't get so caught up in the mandate portion of it because uh, the courts have ruled that government um, can mandate you to do things that are in the better good of others. That's the reason why in every state except maybe one, you're mandated to have car insurance. You know, it's the, it's the same thing and it's the same concept. Um, however, 
Uh, I, I do think we just needlessly gave a lot of money to insurance corporations that were part of the problem. Um, but I do think we moved forward significantly in the fact that in, in two aspects. One, eliminated pre-existing conditions. Mm -hmm. That was a major problem before the Affordable Care Act. And two, uh, having students on their parents' policies until 26. It also that took away also a cap on, on benefits. Yeah, and the cap on benefits as okay. well. Yeah, um, both of those, uh, or all of those things, I believe, were good aspects of the bill. Um, I, I do think, uh, but I do think we should uh, look at revising it so it's not such a free money giveaway to the people who caused the problem in the first place. Well, you, um, uh, we were talking before the uh, show started, and you have a heart condition? Correct. Has, has the Affordable Care Act played any role in the health care you're getting? It, it actually, the Affordable Care Act itself did not. Um, but when Obama w first went into office, uh, I was on TRICARE insurance, which is the military insurance, uh, and there was some sort of order signed removing caps from that insurance before the Affordable uh, Care Act had even gone through. Okay. Um, and I was right, uh, I was really close at that point to my $2 million cap on my TRICARE policy. And so that allowed me to get health care for longer than I would have had it not been for that okay. cap. Um, the Affordable Care Act itself, uh, I, I don't, I don't use that for my insurance, so um, it hasn't really helped me. Um, my, I haven't been on my parents' policies since it's been signed, um, so that part hasn't helped me. Probably pre-existing conditions has helped me, uh, although most of my insurance has been employment-based. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, but and your still. your heart condi condition is the reason you have your trademark seg seg segway, isn't it? Correct. Yeah, okay. I can go short distances on foot, but I can't go really far. Otherwise, my adrenaline starts surging, and I can have cardiac arrest. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about the ten or eleven uh, million people who are not in this country legally? Should they be given a path to citizenship? I think they should be given a given a path to citizenship based on what they do. Um, based on showing uh, that they deserve the citizenship, not necessarily based on money. Um, I think the system right now is so heavily based on money. Uh, I have some friends who have actually become citizens, and uh, the lowest that they, the lowest that I've heard paid was fifty thousand dollars for the entire process. Um, because to lawyers, yeah, because you pretty much have to get a lawyer involved. The process is so so obscure and so complicated that there's really no way unless your IQ is in the genius range and you're really heavily educated to do it uh, without a lawyer. And it's a very long, very drawn out process and it's very difficult and I think we're asking things of these people that we wouldn't even hold ourselves to, which I don't think is necessarily fair. Okay. Um, I don't think that many U.S. citizens, myself included, and I bet you Paul Ryan as well, could take the immigration test and pass. Um, and so I think we need to restructure it so it's more based on what they can do in our country and for our country and with us than less based on things that don't even matter in money. Um, I do think that since almost everyone who's living in this country within the last 200 years their family was immigrants, um, I do think that it would be, uh, I, I do think it's kind of, uh, kind of uh, hypocritical to s sit here and say that no one should be able to immigrate to this country. Um, you enjoyed the opportunities back then, or your family did, and you would have if you would have been there. I don't think anyone's going to sit here and say if they weren't alive back then, they wouldn't have enjoyed the opportunities that this country had to offer. So, um, and, and they can't give a real good reason as to why to deny those opportunities to other people. I haven't seen anyone who's been trying to get citizenship in the country um, who's become a legitimate terror threat. You know, I don't, I don't buy the whole terrorism aspect. And I think if we start bringing more jobs in the country through outsourcing regulations, then we won't have to worry about people taking jobs. And, I, and, I, and really, to be honest, the jobs that these immigrants are working are jobs that most Americans wouldn't want to work to begin with. Long hours, low pay, very he heavy duty work. And, and I believe that if you can work yourself up from there, to somewhere better, then you deserve to be somewhere better, okay. um, I, w regardless of where you were born. Okay, I asked this candidate of all congressional candidates, both Medicare and Social Security are on track to go bankrupt eventually. How would you, as a member of Congress, Congress fix them, Jeremy? 
Uh, well, I think with Medicare and Social Security, we have to look more into Medicaid and SSI. Medicare and Social Security is Medicare and SSDI. Those are what you pay into when you're working. Every worker pays into those, um, and those are either retirement or disability-related uh, uh, programs. Um, and that, but SSI and Medicaid are needs-based. Um, and those are through still and, and that's the reason why the Social Security program is having so much so many problems is because those are costing so much money. Now if we raise the minimum wage to a livable wage and get more and better jobs here, I then see. we won't have as much reliance and the Medicare and the SSDI uh, I believe would start to fund themselves or at least come very close to it based off the contributions that people have been paying. I don't think it's right to say you've been paying into this all your life, we're going to take it away. Okay. And I don't think it's right to say you're uh, on the lowest, you know, you're you have such a hard time skating by for no problem of your own, maybe you were born disabled or whatever, you can't live now. Okay. Uh, I don't think either one is healthy or, or right. Um, it's so timely, I'm also asking all candidates this question. Your reaction to Judge Crabb's ruling on same-sex marriage? I, I think it was a great ruling. Um, okay. I, think that, uh, I think that people should be able to marry whoever they feel. Uh, there's no, there, there was nothing about marriage uh, it, when it was founded that was based on procreation. Uh, it was supposed to be about legal rights and about two people who have a bond together um, forming, uh, uh, forming that bond into a new level. And I think that uh, people uh, of same sex are just as likely or just as easy to have that relationship as people of opposite sex. And I do think, and I think the studies are starting to show, that people are born that way. And I don't think we can discriminate against anybody based off something they're born okay. with. I, I never chose to be straight. My mom never chose to be a lesbian. It's just, it, it's just the way it is. Uh, and I, I think it's inhumane to treat anybody less than another person. And I think the religious people that are trying to push, uh, push these constitutional amendments like Julianne Appling, they're, uh, they're taking one or two very small passages of the Bible in exchange for a very broad context that's all throughout the Bible of treating others how you would like to be treated. How would they feel if people started coming for heterosexual marriage? How would I feel? Uh, on energy policy, what's your position on the Keystone Pipeline? I am opposed to the Keystone Pipeline. I don't think that, uh, I, I think it's pretty clear that it's going to result in environmental problems and I don't think that we'll be able to get a lot of that damage back and I think it's going to be too late by the time we realize that and by the time we know that and there's going to be a lot of resources that we're going to wish we had that we no longer have due to, uh, due to oil interests and due to Obama caving to them. Uh, within the last year, because of Edward Snowden, we've learned a lot about the activities of the NSA. As a congressional candidate, what's your reaction to what you've learned about uh, uh, NSA? Well, Edward Snowden's revelations only go so far. Uh, my entire consulting firm, uh, my main, the main job behind my consulting firm is government counter surveillance. I do work with, uh, I do work with manufacturers um, of cell phones on counteracting and intel work uh, for the NSA wiretapping program. And, uh, and although I can't disclose much of what we talk about, that's just, that's just a small piece of information that Edward Snowden gave us and I don't even know much of the whole programs that are going on. So uh, given, given what you do with your uh, consulting firm, was d d did, did you not learn anything new from what Mr. Snowden leaked? Not from what Mr. Snowden leaked, no. Um, however, uh, I do think we need safeguards in place so people have their privacy. I, th I don't think that the government should be able to store this data on anyone and everyone and access it at will. Um, I think that there should have to be some sort of warrant system to start collecting data on somebody. Um, and that, uh, it, it's the same with wiretapping. I mean, this data is so extensive and their programs are so extensive that it is, in my opinion, wiretapping, even though they even though they may or may not be actually physically tapping everyone's phones. Mm -hmm. um, but they are getting personal, the same type of personal information, even from what everybody knows, they're getting the same type of personal information that you could get from a phone call. Or they can get it from this metadata. And, um, 
and, and I find that to be a privacy breach. And I also see a lot of problems uh, in the future that could come about. I'm not saying they would, but they could. And we, we, we're supposed to write legislation to prevent something really bad from happening. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one part of writing legislation where the government could end up using it against people in, in, in very illegal ways. Um, I mean, what happens if you get a president who just says, I don't really care about laws anymore and disgraces his opponent based on private conversations he had with his girlfriend or whatever. It, it's just too easy with how the programs are set up and well, I do believe we need safeguards. The NSA is doing that because of the war on terrorism. L let me ask you a, a, a international question. When do you think the United States should put, uh, go, I'll go back to the trite term, boots on the ground to fight international terrorism? I mean, uh, lessons learned from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, your thoughts on that? Uh, well, I think one of the lessons learned uh, from Iraq and Afghanistan is we can't go and try to change an entire culture. Um, we went in there trying to make them us. And that's, that's where we completely failed. You can't, you can't go and try to, we basically tried to assimilate two countries. And um, assimilation doesn't work, it hasn't worked, and you're always gonna have backlash from that. But the other thing is, we need to learn how to treat our allies. From Vietnam to Iraq to Afghanistan, every, all of those wars, the people we were fighting were allies before we were fighting them. And we as a country tend to use people and then disregard them and then get upset when they get upset. And we need to look at how we're doing that um, and how we treat our allies um, moving forward too. Um, because if they're important enough to be an ally then, I do believe that we should try to keep them as an ally. And I think, I, I think, I think we just have a habit of using people and then completely throwing them under the bus. And I don't, I, I, I'm not saying I support terrorism, but I can at least understand why someone would be upset when that happens. That's human nature. Anyone who gets used and thrown under the bus gets upset. And uh, while they may take it to the wrong level, um, it's at least understandable. And if we can understand their frustration, then we can at least help try to work towards resolving it in the future. Okay, we're almost out of time. I just have a couple more questions. Do you think Paul Ryan will use it against you that at this moment you don't you don't live in the first district? I don't think so. Well, he may try. Okay. But uh, I think I can represent the first district just as well as he can. He's never in the first district. I actually probably spend more time in the first district than he does. Um, he doesn't meet with the constituents. He doesn't show up for his floor meetings and committee meetings half the time. Uh, and so I, I don't see how he could be a better representative of the district than I would be. You know, I would meet with constituents, I'd show up to the meetings I'm supposed to, and that's the whole job of a representative. He doesn't even do his job. So uh, I, I don't see how uh, my geographical location would make a difference. Plus, I'm not really that far away. Um, and I do have a lot of friends in the district, uh, and I have gone there plenty of times, and I would move to the district if elected. In your fundraising letter that's on your website, I believe the Eric Cantor election has shown that people want change in government. You think you can pull off a uh, uh, upset like uh, what happened to Mr. Cantor? I'm certainly going to try. Okay. I'm certainly going to try. I, I do think people are saying it's because of immigration and all this, but it's all speculation as to why uh, David Bratt won. Um, I think it was just because people wanted something radically different and because Eric Cantor, just like Paul Ryan, exemplifies the system of exactly what is wrong with this country. Um, and the big money system and the not meeting with constituents and not caring what they have to say. And I think people want something different. And I think some people may not know exactly what that is yet, but that's why I hope to present that to them. Very good. Jeremy Ryan of Ranis Madison is a Republican running in the 1st Congressional District. Jeremy, thanks for visiting with uh, Wisconsin Eye. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you.